So, welcome everybody to our masterclass with the outstanding cellist Gary Hoffman. This is day two of the National Concert Hall's International Master Course. We've already had a seminar from Gwendolyn, and now we have a very, what should be a very interesting cello masterclass with three young cellists waiting to play for Gary and to benefit from his expertise. Gary, you're very welcome. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick introduction to Gary. Gary Hoffman is one of the outstanding cellists of our time, combining instrumental mastery, great beauty of sound, and a poetic sensibility in his distinctive and memorable performances. He gained international renown upon his victory at the Rostropovich International Competition in Paris in 1986. Playing with the world's most noted orchestras, he shares his engagements between Europe, America, and Asia, and is the guest of the main venues throughout the world. Gary Hoffman performs on major recital and chamber music series and prestigious festivals. He devotes time to teaching, having been the youngest faculty appointee in the history of the Indiana University School of Music. He is also a professor at the Music Chapel in Brussels in Belgium. It is a huge honour to have Gary on our faculty. I know that I speak for my co-artistic director, Gwendolyn Mason, when I say that. I would also like to mention the masterclass will last approximately two hours and immediately will be followed by a Q&A with Gary. So if you are watching this online on YouTube, you can submit questions for Gary at any time via the YouTube live chat. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first participant, and that is Ellen Baumring Gledhill. Good afternoon to you, Ellen, and welcome to our class. Ellen is an 18-year-old cellist from London. She was the only cellist to reach the strings category final of the BBC Young Musician competition in 2020, which was broadcast in May. Ellen studies the cello with her uncle, Dr. Oliver Gledhill, uh, as Dadario Strings Cello Scholar at Junior Guildhall. Last month, at the end of her final year at Junior Guildhall, she was awarded the Principal's Prize as the most outstanding student on any instrument. She has a scholarship to study at the Royal Academy of Music in London from September 2020. And I think Ellen is going to play the second and third movements from Chopin's wonderful cello sonata. And I'm very sorry we don't have the piano to go with that because it's such an amazing piano part, but I'm sure it will sound gorgeous. So Ellen, welcome. And uh, over to you now, Gary and Ellen. Thank you.
Very beautiful, Alan. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, of course, it's the first time I'm meeting you and hearing you. Uh, my impression is, first of all, clearly you're a very gifted person. You're a very gifted person. And um, uh, obviously, uh, you feel a great deal for music. You're very committed to what you do. And that's, of course, to be um, admired. And um, it's, it's the way it should be. So uh, just so it's clear, whatever I might say doesn't in, in any way um, uh, suggest that, that that's not important. It's, it's, it's paramount. It must be there. What I would like to say is, and I, you seem like an intelligent person, so I, I think it's quite possible that some of the things I might say you either have thought about or you've, you're aware of, perhaps it's been told to you, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but what we feel for music is essential, but it's not the whole story. And it's funny because I'm thinking of something that was told to me by a very great musician who I bring up because in fact, he passed away and most people know who this is, it's Leon Fleischer. And he passed away yesterday and um, I happened to know him well and um, played with him many times. And he was one of those people that uh, if you had the good fortune to meet, you, you'll never forget him. And he made a big difference in many people's lives and mine as well. And he was one of those people that had a way of articulating ideas and saying them in a very simple way, but in a very profound way, <clears throat> and a way that clarified what might be certain things that remain somewhat mysterious in our minds. And I would love, just like to relay one of the most important things I remember him saying, which I think pertains to you and it pertains to all of us, but in this particular, um, situation, it pertains to this whole issue about what, what music is about in terms of what one feels and, and, and how it needs to be balanced with other aspects that are also and equally important. Um, kind of to illustrate that it's not about ever one thing, um, though they all have to be there. And once again, I I, I reiterate, you are clearly a gifted person and somebody has great passion and feels music very deeply. That's always to be commended. So um, as long as that's clear. What he explained once, which I thought he did in a very um, eloquent way, was that he, he wanted to identify and clarify what in his opinion was the process of playing. When everything is working as it should, when the important elements are there and, and how they form a whole. And his suggestion was the process of playing is similar to a triangle. And on a triangle, there are three points. And it doesn't really matter where you start because in the end, one influences the other, but let's start in the obvious place the idea, that's the first point on the triangle. The idea could also be the feeling, the sentiment, the impulse, call it what you want. We're essentially talking about the same thing. We're talking about a musical impulse. And some people use other terms. We can call it the feeling you have for something, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So that's the first point on the triangle. The next point on the triangle. How do we play it? Let's use the term technique. That to me is what technique is. It's a, it's a term that's used very frequently, but I think very often without clarity. What is technique? Technique, I think, is the physical realization and the means that are required to articulate in sound a musical idea or feeling. That's technique. And all aspects of it, of course. 
but that's what it is. In other words, you have an idea. What do I have to do with my body to make that into audible sound so that it comes through as some type of audible communication? So we hear what it is this person's thinking. And then the third part of the triangle, what did that sound like? In other words, did we hear what we did? Did we hear what came out of the instrument? And what was it? And his suggestion was, unless those three aspects are in balance and constantly flowing, then something is missing. I, he didn't say this, but I would even go so far as to say, that's what makes playing really alive and spontaneous. Because the fact is, it's true. You could have, I'm not talking about you, any of us. You could have an idea. You could have executed it. But if you don't actually hear what it was, you don't really truly know what the next feeling or idea should be. It is true. We do have what's written on the page and we do study it and we do have an idea more or less of what we want to do, but it's like taking a trip. This is a map. So when you are taking a trip, you always have the option to deviate, but you know where you're going. But if you deviate and you don't know where you're going, you're lost. It's essentially it. So whereas you have the idea and you know more or less what that is and you feel that, okay, and then you play and you practice and you have an idea how to do that. But unless one really hears it, it's not going to really connect to what the next event will be, even if you know what the next note is and even if you know more or less how you would like to do it. So I think that's essential to make playing really alive because obviously, and I'm sure you know that because I can see the kind of player you are, um, we can feel all the things that we want and we can think all the things that we want. But in the end, in terms of performance, we always have to hear what we're doing and respond to that. Now, I'm not saying that you don't hear what you're doing. I'm, I'm not saying that. The sense that I have is that the balance can be shifted a little bit because I sense you are very in tune with and very concerned with what you're feeling about the music you're playing. And once again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing, but that is not the whole story. And I think what we should be aiming for in playing is of course that is there. And that's one aspect and an incredibly important one without that the rest doesn't make any difference. But without the rest and in proper balance, that will not be articulated and communicated and uh, arrive and you will not arrive at the result that ultimately you want to look for. And that's very important to me in the artistic endeavor. Some people feel, well, that's all that's really interesting in a performance is what the musician feels about the piece. I would say that's not all that there is. And that's not the only interesting thing is for me, first and foremost, but I hope I'm not stepping any on any toes here. For me, what I'm most interested first and foremost in hearing a piece of music is to hear the piece of music. That's it. We obviously are conduits for the listener to hear what this music is. So what we feel about it is essential, but only in so far as it's presenting that piece of music. So we must have a reaction to it, but then we have to be very concerned with what the music is about. And I'm not saying you're not, please don't say that, think that I'm saying that I'm not, but I'm just speaking generally now. We have to be very concerned with what that music is about. We have to be very concerned with how we're realizing it physically. And we have to be concerned with what that sounds like. And then be very much um, in tune with, is, is the piece coming across as we see it? And as such, what we feel about it is important, but it's not the whole thing, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if that makes sense to you as I, as I, as I explained it. 
or if this is something new, or if this sort of perhaps reinforces things you've thought about or things that you've perhaps heard. Um, it does. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, the, 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 the next thing that I just wanted to say just about that, and then we'll look at, at some, of, some of the Chopin. Um, I think that's my impression. You know, I used to be young too. And I used to ask myself all the questions you're asking yourself and, and so forth. I think, and once again, I'm, I'm speaking in generalities, but some of this I feel does apply to you. We sometimes feel so much and we have so much we want to say. And we have this music makes us, you know, we live for it. That's great. If I could give you an analogy, I don't know if you like animals, but maybe you like cats. Could be a small dog. Do you like, do you have a pet? I don't have pets, but I okay. do like cats. Well, but you like dogs? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So let's say you had a tiny little dog. I happen to like big dogs, but let's say you have a tiny little dog and you just love this dog so much. You want to hug and hug that little dog, but he's just a little dog. And you have so much love for that dog. You hug him and hug him. You hug him so hard. Well, what's going to happen to that dog if you hug him really hard? Um, Not, nothing good. Yeah, it's going to like crush it, kind of. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes I have a little bit of that feeling that you want to hug this music so hard mm -hmm. that you get a little bit in your own way with it. Okay? Now, though I understand the impulse to do so, I think this goes back to what I'm talking about, balance. So if I could suggest in general, just in your practicing. It's clear how much love you have here for, for music. It's clear how much you want to say, and that is essential. But just as essential is that you allow yourself to let those emotions flow out and go really into the instrument and flow out of your body into the instrument and therefore come out in terms of sound. You already do a great deal. I have a sense that you can do more. And if you would just allow yourself to do it, I have a little bit of the sense that you're hugging that little doggy much too hard. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think that we fear that if we let go of that, there won't be anything left. It's empty. It's not empty. Those feelings are there. Those thoughts are there. The fact that you may, don't, may not force them out it doesn't mean they're not there. They are there. Mm -hmm. but, but if you allow them to flow out, if you allow them to emerge along with the other things that you need, it's possible that the whole picture in the end will be perhaps even greater than you thought it could be. That's what I'm thinking. Does this make any sense to you at all? Yeah, no, no, it definitely does. Okay. Good. That, that requires, I think, on your part, if I could say it, a certain amount of trust in yourself. I'm not saying you don't trust yourself. I, have, I don't know you. I, I'm not going to sit here and say, it looks like you don't have self-belief. I don't know that. I, I wouldn't say that. But I'd just like to tell you that you have these things. You have these things inside. You feel these things. You can do a lot on the cello. Just let them come out. Mm -hmm. let them that's part i think of the aspect and the the process of playing do the things that we need for the event to take place you're inviting people over for dinner you set the table you have a good menu you have the right recipes you've done it before you know exactly but you never know what that dinner is going to be you have to wait till the people show up until the evening takes place. You don't know what it's going to be. And you have to let it happen. You can't force everybody. No, you said the wrong thing. No, it's your turn to talk now. No, I wish you would take the fork. Don't take the spoon. You do that, you know, it's not going to be a fluid, fun evening. Okay. In spite of, in spite of that, there's already many beautiful things that come out and you're playing and I can feel very much what you want to do. Now, what I hope for is that you can trust yourself a little bit more that these things will be there and you breathe more 
and breathe more from your the lower part of you know your well, I can't show you because we're online but you know sort of from your from your belly mm -hmm. and not from up here and breathe more slowly breathe more deeply and just have a sense of more inner calm as you play and trust that those feelings and those thoughts are there and they will come out and you don't need to force any of these emotions they're there they're part of you they're part of the music they'll come through okay mm -hmm. let's start with let's do a little of the third movement first because that pretty much deals with that purely and simply with nothing else and then we can go back and do a little of the second movement okay mm -hmm. Ellen, can, can I ask you, think about the sound you want. Think about the character, but you don't need to. You know what the character is. It's inside you. You feel that. And try to breathe. If you can, try not to tense up these muscles here. Okay? Just let them go. I mean, I know a lot of people are watching and I, I generally don't concern myself with people feeling embarrassed or anything like that in a master class because I think people understand I'm just trying to help them. You know, I, normally I would ask you to say, ah, and leave your mouth open and try the opening phrase, ah. If you're willing to do that, I would be happy if you did it. If you don't want to, I'm not going to in any way force you to do it. I mean, I can try it. <laughs> yeah. So try starting with ah, just say ah. Ah. Yeah. And feel feel that. Ah. Uh. You, you don't have to continue saying ah, but leave your mouth open. Uh. And try to play the first phrase and leave all these muscles relaxed. Ah. Yeah. Uh. If you close your mouth. Did I? Right away. <laughs> okay. Uh, Let's try and still feel that here. Right? I just want you to concentrate on that. Don't even think about playing or what you hear, just that. Because what happens is, if I could say, and maybe you're starting to realize, there is a considerable amount of excess, excess tension in certain parts of your body when you play. Mm -hmm. That would be good to try to, uh, to get rid of. Why? It's impossible to play tension free. We're using our body, muscle exertion is happening. It's impossible to play in a relaxed way. It's mm. a complete misunderstanding to think we can play in a relaxed way. The only way to, to be relaxed is to lie down in bed. And we can't really play the cello that way. I mean, not practically. The point is not to be relaxed. The point is to know what should be in muscle tension, what should not be, when and how. We're athletes in that respect. You have to use your muscles. Therefore, tension is being exerted. The question is not relaxed or tense. It's neither one, okay? Mm -hmm. Both are present and you want tension where it's necessary and when it's necessary. And not in the parts of bo the body where it is not necessary. Because the fact is that will take away from where you need it. So what's happening is you create a lot of tension here sometimes in your breathing, in your chest, because the breathing gets disturbed. And therefore you're holding tension in parts of your body that doesn't actually allow the energy to flow to where it needs to go. Let's start the beginning again. You don't have to do the ah thing, but okay. do be conscious of what is happening here. It's your breathing apparatus. That's your, that's your voice. That's the same as singing. And if we're blocking it here, chances are we're blocking it playing the cello as well. Mm -hmm. Okay? Nice. 
nice. There was more flow in the sound. There was more freedom in the sound. Let's talk about the first note. I mean, you vibrate the way you want. You look for the sound that you want. My feeling is, if you were not so perpendicular to the string, and if you were slightly more pronated, the motion that you would provide with your vibrato would be slightly more complex. The vibrato motion is a, a multiple motion. It's not a single motion. It is an up and down motion for sure, but there should be a diagonal component too if we want to create real interest in the sound. Mm. You do, but you tend to be more perpendicular than pronated when you start. For my ears, that takes away an important component in the motion of the vibrato. Try starting with your hand, your arm slightly more pronated. Yes, and a little bit. I don't know how much, you have to try. But let's, let's listen to that sound, just the first note. Yeah. What if you try contacting the string with a little bit more surface? You know, we don't, we don't have to use only the tip of our finger, of course. I mean, this is all usable from here, pretty much down to here. Mm -hmm. And I think we should vary it depending on what is necessary. If you want more precise attacks, obviously more towards the tip. If you want a thicker sound in terms of what the vibrato can do and just the contact of the playing finger on the string, we should play closer to the first joint. I didn't say on, I didn't say, you know, one millimeter away, but closer. Because that's obviously a fatter, yes. So why don't you play, and then with a slightly more pronated hold and see what happens. Let it develop the sound and listen, to, and listen, yeah, mm. let's keep going. Three. Now we're talking. Mm -hmm. You hear the difference, right? Yeah. So you were blocking here as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in other words, but I don't think it comes from some kind of physical issue. My feeling is all that comes from a physical manifestation of a desire to achieve something. So it's all good. But now I feel your job is to figure out what you really should be doing with your body, what you shouldn't be doing with your body, mm -hmm. and enjoying hearing those results and going for that and realizing that it's, as with all the talent you have, it's still not enough just to feel it and to feel it harder and harder and harder and it will come out. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant. You heard that, the difference on the one note. Mm -hmm. That note became more beautiful and it had all the feeling behind it. I think that's all we need to do with the third movement. Let's do a little of this of the second, okay? okay? Okay. It's a dance, it's not a mazurka. It has something of a mazurka. He doesn't say what it is, you know? It's one of those pieces that it's clearly dance related, but there's maybe not an exact dance. I mean, he, he wrote waltzes, he wrote polonaise, he wrote lots of dances, but this is not any of those. It has something of a mazurka character, but it has a bounce and it has a swing. And I think we need to feel that in your body. Don't hold it all up here. Let your body become part of that, okay? The down beat goes up. The second beat, which is usually weaker, goes down. Okay? So ta da ta da. Let's do ta da ta da. Just that. Yeah, there's some weight to it. It's not hard, it's not muscular, but it has weight. 
Let's try that. Just, just play it. Don't, don't, don't squeeze the little dog too hard. Just play it. Maybe a little lower in the bow. Yeah, I miss the weight in the second beat. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I say weight, I'm spelling it E I G H T, not A I. Mm -hmm. Weight. Not an accent, just weight. Mm -hmm. Feel that your right arm is heavier there. Yeah. Mm. 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 Let's try the whole phrase. Okay. Very good. And I'm sure that you can do even more if you didn't try to just sort of feel all of that stuff at a little bit at the expense of the just the body moving freely. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. Sorry. Good. It should be fluid, probably not rushed. Beautiful. You know, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time, I feel. I think that's right. I believe so. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I'm not sure. I think we are. But um, obviously, you know, we, um, we went through, uh, we didn't do much on the piece. I just wanted to establish a few things that hopefully will be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, at some point in the future, um, you know, we'll be able to go into more detail. But I think what I heard you do now, for me, I don't know how it sounded to you, but to me, it was more in it. I didn't lose anything of what you were feeling. Mm -hmm. I had the sense of what you were after. I just heard more of what it was and it seemed more natural. And I felt you used your body more naturally. So I don't know if, if I think you understand exactly what I mean. I, I understand all those things that you want and I applaud that. Just trust that those will be there too, okay? Yeah. And, and let them be part of something more, okay? Because you need all the other things too. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as you know by now, the whole process of playing is very complex, you know, and it's never just about one thing, you know, mm -hmm. but you have an awful lot and I'm sure, you know, things are gonna go very well for you. So, you know, good luck to you. Hopefully I'll see you in person sometime. Thank you so much. It's You're been very so welcome. helpful. Good, great. Thank you. Pleasure. You're very welcome. Take care. Oh, thank you so much, Ellen and Gary. That was a fascinating class and lovely to hear you speak about Leon Fleischer. I was lucky enough to have a one masterclass with him at Ravinia Festival about 20 years ago and I still remember what he said about the Alban Berg Sonata and about just like you said about listening to what you just played and how it links to what you're going to play next and join, joining everything up. So um, yeah, well, he was an amazing person and 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 the thing about Leon is he was always right. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> He was an amazing man. Yes, he was. So moving on, we are very grateful and delighted to have Zoe here, uh, Zoe Nagel from Cork. Zoe is a former student of Christopher Marwood at the CIT Cork School of Music, and she is currently pursuing a bachelor's degree at the Hochschule für Musik und Theater in Munich in Germany in the class of Julian Steckel. She has been a multiple prize winner in competitions throughout Ireland. A keen chamber musician, she also performed at this year's Chamber Music Gathering at the National Concert Hall. So welcome Zoe, and I think you're going to play us the prelude from Bach's second cello suite, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly, yes. Great, thank you. Thank you. 
Bravo, Zoe. Sounds excellent. Really. Um, how's Julian doing? I haven't seen him in years. He's, he's great. He told me to say hello. <laughs> well, please give him my very best. Uh, I'm just, I'm just curious, let's go through it. And I wanted to ask you actually a couple of questions. The first one was, you know, this whole business about the ending. Um, I'm wondering how you came up with, with that particular um, solution for the chords. Um, to be honest, I actually, I was listening, I was just listening to a lot of different recordings. Mm -hmm. Um, Julian actually suggested that I do something different, uh, which I, he kind of basically came up, he kind of does his own kind of a cadenza, um, okay. rather than the, than the arpeggios. Um, I basically just, I was listening to like, for example, like Yo-Yo Ma does the, does, does the straight chords and then I was kind of listening to Bill's Ma playing the arpeggios and I, I just went with the arpeggios, but definitely it's not. I haven't um well no knowing what Belsma did you know he he never did the same thing so I, I I don't know I I knew him and and you know I heard him play this but I have one set of recordings that I haven't heard in you know a thousand years and and he did them many times my guess is that he probably changed it all the time um but um I'm just wondering just about the whole idea because I know that it's become um let's say, whatever word, I don't know what word, popular, let's say, to, to, to ornament those last chords. Um, I'm just curious to know what, what, your, what your thought is about actually just playing it as it appears, what, and what you think about that. I, I actually, I've been practicing the chords, yeah. the three chords more actually than, the, than playing the arpeggios. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose I just kind of thought that it was, I was wondering if it was uncharacteristic just to have such sustained chords, but maybe that's not true. You know, it, it's definitely um, an enigmatic uh, aspect of, of, of the Bach suites, you know, that, that, that's one of those, you know, everybody has a different opinion. You probably know in one of the manuscripts on on the chords you see some ledger lines at the bottom of the chords on the stem suggesting that the these are the chords but the rhythm is 16ths yeah okay now however one might interpret that and however what weight one might give to that over another manuscript that does not have that and this is food for thought and for endless lifelong discussion and we'll never come up with an answer. Yeah. The thing is, of course, in the end, the only important thing is that you come up with your own answer and at a, any point along the way, you're of course free to change that. And that makes you of course realize that there is no answer and there is no right way. The only thing that's right is when it sounds right. And what makes it right is if it's convincing and it's convincingly played and if it, it becomes convincing when it is felt and performed in a convincing way. My experience with Bach in general, um, oh yes, I, there was a time when I discussed and thought about style and this and that and what to do. But you know, Belsma himself, I remember I had a discussion with him about a pertinent issue about trills and said, what do you think, Honor, about this and that? And you know, he just looked at me and says, what do you think? Okay. And I said, well, for me, it's this. He says, that's what you should play then. Okay. And I thought that was very interesting and also liberating coming from a guy who was looked up to by so many people as, you know, you know, the one. And he was the last to be dogmatic about these things, okay. you know. And in fact, he wasn't a dogmatic person at all. Um, and I think if you're the kind of person which you seem to be, that you're interested, you're curious, you want to try. Um, I think in the end, those kinds of people realize there's never just one answer. Yeah. And you can always do it again. You don't have to decide for your whole life. Yeah. You will have more opportunities. And 
I remember once I saw Belsma, we were somewhere together and he had to go away for a day. I said, what's going on? He said, I have to go play box suites. So I said, well, okay. So I mean, that shouldn't be a huge problem for you. He says, no, it is. He said, because I've changed all the Boeings and I haven't had time to practice it. Okay. Yeah. You know, so there you are, you know, so I think that's very interesting to hear from somebody that we always placed in a very, you know, on a very high pedestal as, you know, some, and I think that's important to remember. After that, um, I remember just about this one place because we talked about it and he said, no, he could see that the chords, just the chords, he said, like genuflecting. Mm -hmm. da -da -da. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. And you know, the point is, was Bach thinking that when he wrote that? Maybe, and probably not, right? But it doesn't matter. Because if that's something that you feel can be and it's suitable in, in this prelude and that that could be a possible way of ending such a piece, yeah, why not? It's a poetic idea. It doesn't in any way go against this music. It has a prayerful uh, kind of character. Yeah. It's quite possible. If you can think of things like that, I would say, I mean, I'm not saying you can't. I mean, if one can think of things like that, yeah. I mean, those are, those are definitely important and possible musical impulses. I, I just wanted to discuss it because it's always been interesting. Yeah. And I guess as, uh, as I've gone through uh, this journey, you know, through life and cello and all this music, sometimes I think, you know, in a way, there is something to the simple approach at the end, at the end, because you can do all these other things, but sometimes, and I'm not trying to sell this, but um, sometimes when you just do the simple thing, you think, actually, you know, it was fine just like that and very convincing. And I, I worried a little bit too much about, gee, what about that? Because I also thought it's so odd. We all think it's odd when you come to that point and just chords, yeah. you know, just chords. And why, why that? And maybe, anyway, one thing for sure, if Bach wanted that, there wouldn't have been any other way to write it. Yeah. That was it, you know, <laughs> you know. Anyway, it's very beautifully played. I, I would like to talk about a couple of things, um, which, you know, my, hopefully will be helpful. Um, the whole issue of vibrato not vibrating, should we vibrate or never vibrate or whatever, all that I observe is that you occasionally vibrate certain notes. Mm -hmm. um, that's fine. We, that's why I don't even want to discuss the style, the stylistic aspect of it, should or should not, you know, um, because I think many approaches are possible. But since you occasionally do vibrate, the only thing I would have said is, I wasn't always uh, sure as to why you chose to vibrate certain notes and then not others. In other words, I do think that vibrato is possible, actually. I'm not one of those that believes that we should never use it in Bach. But I think there should be a reason, like in any music, it's just that it's likely that this music does not benefit from what eventually became what we know now as continuous vibrato, which basically started, it seems, with Isai. So, um, and I agree with that. On the other hand, uh, it certainly does have a function sometimes. And since you occasionally do vibrate, there were times I was thinking, gee, I wonder why Zoe doesn't vibrate that note. And then you vibrated another note and I thought, why that one? Mm -hmm. And then I thought you got to one that I would have thought, okay, maybe she'll vibrate this one. And then you didn't. And then five notes later in the middle of a line, there was one note vibrated. And I thought, what was the function of that? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you should calculate these things because I think like everything else, it has to be part of a whole way of speaking and playing. We don't calculate like right now, I'm not calculating what I'm saying, but I have a general idea, I think, of what I would like to say. 
So I think the vibrato doesn't have to be in any way, you know, planned, but it does need to have a function, I think. There were times, let's say, there were certain bass notes, certainly important harmonic notes. I thought maybe those, if you see that those could be vibrated, maybe those. When you're in the middle of a scale and one note was vibrated, I wondered why that note. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that strikes me as important. Yeah. You know, not the question of should I vibrate or not. You apparently feel that it, it's possible sometimes. Okay, on that premise, I would say maybe just listen a little bit more to when you think it actually would benefit the music in an expressive way or a structural way too. Of course, you get to an important moment, a low note on the C string, bom, bom, bom. the motto is spread over a huge interval. Maybe you feel that maybe would benefit from about things like that. You know, the other thing I wanted to, and we'll go uh, to the beginning of the prelude, just the whole, I'm not saying you don't play in tune, but the whole idea of intonation, mm -hmm. what it means, because it's a verb that's very rarely used, to intonate. We always talk about intonation, but we never talk about intonating. Mm -hmm. And usually if I, if I use that word, people wonder what I mean by that. Well, I think it's pretty clear. To intonate, that means to relate in some way, I think. So in other words, it's not a question of playing in tune. It's a question of what we should be hearing or listening for in order to intonate, which to me suggests that it, it's in, and I'm not saying that you don't feel this way or maybe you don't, I, we can discuss it. But um, for me, intonation is not an absolute thing. It's always relative. For me, the question is what should we be intonating to? Is it possible that in a group of notes, there's a central pitch that we should be intonating around? Mm -hmm. Well, I actually just answered the question with the, the question itself. Yes, it, yes, yes. In other words, these things are just now um, unrelated. They're very much related. And I think within a group of notes, certainly in a piece like this, which is harmonically based, it's very much the case that, <clears throat> This G sharp makes no sense unless it relates to the important notes in that chord or the root of the chord or whatever, things like that. Sometimes I'm not absolutely sure that you're paying enough attention to that kind of thing. The fingers go down, okay. In some contexts, they might be in tune, but based on the F that you played right before, the G sharp didn't seem to relate to that. And then came the open A. And how do you deal with all that? You know, that's what I mean by intonating. Yeah. You know, always thinking of what it should be related to. And it's not always so simple. Theoretically, of course, it relates to the previous note. But of course, it's far more complex than that because the previous note can be just part of a chord and that note actually should be really related to the whole chord. So yeah, it does relate to the previous note, but it relates to much more than that. So let's go from the beginning and, and look at that. I mean, musically, I thought it was very convincing. You had, a, uh, you had a flowing, but sort of reflective approach to the music. And I thought that was, that was convincing in and of itself. So I, it was just these aspects that I wanted uh, you know, to look at. <laughs> The C sharp was, and I agree, quite high, but I think that was almost higher than it even needed to be, though I agree. It, you just play that scale, F, E, D, C sharp. What if you continue all the way down to the low D? Interesting. So you didn't play the C sharp, C sharp quite as high now. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, you could say, but okay, but that C sharp, it's part of a chord too. It is. But when we first hear it, it was part of that descending line. 
So yeah. the question is how high can we play it so that we can make sense of it within the scalar idea and then as part of the new chord. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> Obviously, the B flat is close. It's close. And even expressively speaking, I also agree. It should be on the flatter side. How flat? Do you flat. want this to sound, and I don't mean this in any derogatory way, but do you want this to sound painful? Uh, As an expression. I don't mean, gee, that's hard to hear. I don't mean that. I'm talking about a painful expression. Yeah, I think, I think so. I think that's Okay. Then that's right. But just so you know, that doesn't sound out of tune to me, but it creates a painful expression. Yeah. You know, like there's a, a lot of suffering in that. that. That might be right, but that's how sensitive these things are. At least I feel in intonation, you know. We're not obviously talking about tempered in intonation anymore. What we hear on a piano obviously is all tempered. You know, what we can do on the cello obviously I think is ultimately more expressive in terms of intonation. However, you know, many people ask this question. So, okay, well, that's fine. So you're playing alone. And what if you do play with the piano? Do we have leeway? Yes. Because the sound of the piano is such that there is an acceptable range within which we can work. So we can actually, to a certain extent, change what the listener hears in terms of the piano because of where we yeah. put our pitches. And that's still within the range of acceptable intonation. It doesn't sound, out, it's not so far that it sounds out of tune, but it actually creates a different sense of what the intonation is, even though the piano is not moving. Well, you know what I mean. We do have that range. Of course, we're not dealing with that. The only fixed aspect that we're dealing with is the open strings. And that is something we do have to deal with, obviously. You know, I mean, once again, even then, there's an acceptable range within which the ear hears that is in tune. And to a certain extent, we can utilize that, going higher or lower within that acceptable range. And that can still be perceived of as in tune with the open string. There isn't that one single point. It's not a big range because the A is fixed, the D is fixed, but there is a range and we need to use that. Let's start again and then maybe play a little bit. wasn't really counting, but up to this point, I think you vibrated maybe three notes. Okay. And I'm wondering if you have any way that you, maybe you don't recall which ones. Do you have any idea of why you vibrated those three notes? For the longest time, you vibrated no notes at all. And then there was a passing C and you vibrated it. I'm not even sure if you were aware. Probably not. No. Yeah. I think it might be helpful just to be at least at for a little while, mm -hmm. a little bit more aware of it, not so that you're self-conscious about it, mm -hmm. but just observing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, I wondered, gee, after that little vibrato discussion, maybe she's not gonna vibrate at all now, <laughs> you know? And there were many, many bars that you played without. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly there was a passing C and you vibrated it. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of wondered, what it was that, you know, 
you know, sometimes when we do these things, it's a, just a physical reaction. I don't think we should beat ourselves up about that, but that's probably not really the, the idea of it, right? I mean, sometimes we need to do these things for practical reasons when we're on stage and we feel that the left hand is a bit tight. It might be nice to vibrate a few notes just to get a little bit. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in a purely musical way. Let's go, let's continue from where we were. And maybe just not plan your vibrato, but just be aware of it. Let's take that much. That's starting to make a little more sense. Could you play the opening? Just the very the first three notes. Just three notes. Good. Now let's go to the F major. Pom pom pom. Okay. Would you consider trying just a little bit of vibrato? The idea that there's a certain tension about this opening triad. And when we get to F major, because of the key and because of how that relates to the opening and because we're on the C string, that maybe... Yeah. And it seemed for me closer than I would have heard it anyway, to the beginning. Mm -hmm. And maybe vibrato could have some positive effect there. Maybe let's do ta pa pa then pa 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 just the same again, the opening and then yeah, the opening and then the yeah, just to hear how those relate. Yeah, it's a small difference, but maybe expressively justified. Mm -hmm. There's nothing shocking about it, you know. Let's go on from there. And whatever those, however you feel those in terms of expression or color or sound, anyway, the F sharp is important. As part of the line and of course, as a bass, as a bass note. So maybe I'm not suggesting you vibrate it. I'm not even suggesting you vibrate anything, but with the bow, maybe something else on the F sharp to give it another expression so I can feel it as an important bass note, sonority wise too. Let's look at one thing. Beautiful. Um, could have written, of course, bom, 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 G minor triad. He actually did. To me, that's what we should bring out. Not four notes at all, but some decoration of the initial triad. D minor, now F major. Now G minor, he's not going to play, have us play. It's enough. But I think that's what should emerge. Some ornamented version of. And not just as if they're all of equal importance, you know. Oh, I'm sorry to ask you to start at the same place, but that's always the problem with Bach, right? Where do you start? <laughs> Let's start at F major. It's going to be simpler. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Tiraratati. Beautiful, Zoe. Yeah, now I feel like you're kind of, okay, uh, this vibrato thing. Yeah, I, I feel like you're getting a handle of, on what, what, what you can do. And these are just possibilities because I think the more, the more you go into that, you'll probably have new ideas about it. And then the next day you'll think, well, no, maybe not. And, and you know, that's all. The point is just how, what do you hear and how that can contribute to bringing out in a simple way, because we're not talking about anything complicated, just a simple way, certain things that you feel are important. Now, um, lots of 16s flowing. Maybe you can let them flow without noticeably changing the tempo immediately. Because yeah. okay. it sounded a little bit. In other words, I agree. Yes, it should flow but maybe just let it flow rather than actually making the music go ahead. Let the music flow more. It's sort of, you're holding it, maybe release the reins of the horse a little bit, you know, let it go ahead a little bit. Maybe uh, the high F, if you know the fourth finger. Or another place, that was just a suggestion. Yeah, because it's always impossible to start. That's all, I know that. I G minor. <laughs> G minor is fine. That was more natural. Now in this passage, there's a, there's some important bass notes. I mean, you're not going to stop the flow all the time, but they should come out. Let's go from ta ti ri ri ta ti ri ri tom. Obviously, tom, pom, pom. And of course, they're not. They should not be played all the same way. It's going to be monotonous. If you do a tenuto vibrato on every single one, that becomes, you know, just laborious. On the other hand. Maybe just to think of its important, you that of its importance, and you'll do something. Mm -hmm. That was another Fleischerism. Think it and don't do it. Okay. <laughs> think because when you think it, instead of trying to make a decision as to what you're going to do, you will do something because you have the impulse. Mm -hmm. And all the years of practicing and training and this and that, chances are it's going to result in in some type of difference in how we execute this and that may be enough we maybe don't have to do anything just think it and then we will let's try from ta -ti -ra -ra -rum. yeah <laughs> Here, the c maybe the c not as important as the d but it's important yeah you're now back in the lower reaches of the cello that just suggests to me you go up there's a certain fluency you're in the higher register fine good you come down the strings are thicker the sounds are lower it takes more time to develop the sound it takes the, the listener a little bit more effort to capture the lower sounds Maybe that needs a little more time in comparison to the notes on the A string. Can we do that A minor? Uh, 
It's first finger on the G string. Right. No. A, A, B, C, D, da, da, da. Uh, sorry, yeah. Da, da, de, da, da, da. A, B, C. One, three, four. Yeah, it's that line. That run, yes. Good. Now, I'm not saying you should stop for this, but the, a sequence begins here. Now, I don't think it's important to point out, and you don't have to say to everybody, there's a sequence now. But the fact is, there is a sequence. So it suggests to me that there should be some type of recognition of it. However you deal with that. Can we do the same from the A minor? Maybe don't stop, but change the color of the sound on the B flat. Yeah. But let's do the A minor uh, once again. Also. It's a sequence. You probably, very likely, if you did anything with the tempo, it would tend to flow through the sequence rather than retract. Probably. Therefore, probably don't squeeze the first notes together. Because now you're at a faster tempo. In other words, let it build from somewhere. Don't don't start in mid mid flight, you know. Alright, just me A minor again. Or the F sharp, if you can catch da 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 Yes. I know we're going to run out of time. I wanted to just suggest one thing in another place. You know the place where you're on the A string. Okay. It seems to me, I mean, it could be argued, but it seems to me what Bach is doing is, even though we don't hear it all the way through, the A is there the whole time. I think we should play it as if we're hearing the A. Meaning ta ta ti ti, the climb to the G is pulling farther and farther away from the A, and therefore, like stretching the rubber band, creating more tension. Mm -hmm. And that maybe even suggests that because you're stretching, it's a little bit more effort, it's not easier getting up, it's harder. And actually, we should feel the distances. Let's just try it, and then I think we have to stop because, you know. Yeah. That's the idea. Because I think, in a way, you almost have to make us hear that the A is there all the time. And if you do that, we hear it because you're playing against something, you know? And I think obviously as, once again, to quote him, as Honor Belzma always said, it, it's as if Bach was trying to write the least notes possible. Yes. I mean, he could have had us do something very complicated, go up on the D string. Of course they didn't do that, but, you know, and have the A be heard, but you know, so what does he do? The implication is clear. 
but we have to make that come through. That's the point. And now I hear it. Anyway, I think we're supposed to go to the next person. So congratulations, Zoe. Thank you so much. That was so helpful. Great. You're very welcome and a pleasure to hear you. And please give my best. Thanks. I will. To Julia. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you, Gary. Um, we're well. now going to have a three minute break just to give you a chance to um, to get a breather. And um, we'll be back shortly with the third cellist, that's Padger. And just to let, remind people that we will have a short Q&A with Gary at the end of this class in about 40 minutes, 45 minutes time. So do submit any questions via the YouTube live chat. So um, do join us again in three minutes or so. Thank you so much. Thanks. So welcome back to the final part of our online masterclass with Chalice Gary Hoffman as part of the National Concert Hall's International Master Course, which this year, of course, like everything else in the world, is online or not happening at all. And luckily we have it online and delighted to welcome 
um, for our third performance of the afternoon, Padre Olinchik, Padre from Cork as well. And Padre is a bachelor student at the Royal Irish Academy of Music in Dublin, having just completed his second year under the tutelage of Christopher Marwood. Uh, he is the principal cellist of Sinfonua and is also a member of the mentoring programme of the RTE National Symphony Orchestra for 2020. Hopefully they will postpone that and continue it into next year because I can't imagine there's a lot going on with the orchestra these days. Uh, Padre, I hope I'm right to say that you're from Cork. Maybe I've uh, mortally well, offended you. Are you a Dublin, dub? Actually. You're a dub. I don't know why I said that. So up the dubs. I'm, a, I'm from Dublin too, so that's wonderful. And you're going to play some Dvorak, I think. Yeah, that's it. From the concerto? Great. Okay. You're going to play which which movements are you going to play? Oh, the... sorry, I'm playing the uh, third movement third of movement. the uh, Dvorak concerto in D minor. Third movement of the Dvorak. Excellent, take it away.
carry your own muse at the moment. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Peter. Bravo, bravo. How did I end up being muted? I thought I didn't even touch it. What happened? Okay, it's a mystery. Um, um, sorry, I had a, I lost my train of thought. Uh, okay, um, I'm just curious to know what edition you play from. Uh, the, it's the one edited by Leonard Rose. Oh, the International. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's fine, you know, all these performance editions are fine, I think, as, as reference editions. Yeah. Maybe at some point, you know, if you if you go out, it uh, just get the Eulenburg pocket score. That's quite faithful to the original. It might okay. be it might be um, of interest just to see because there are there's lots of articulation differences. Um, surprisingly, n no differences. You know, even the opening, it's the the original chords are not what's in the Leonard Rose edition and many of the performance editions. I mean, I don't know um, how you feel about that, but I, I, I usually preferred, before I know what anybody else is thinking about anything, I, I usually like to know what the composer actually wrote if we ever have a source that can give us that. Also, I think if you go online, probably on IMSLP, you can find, in fact, the original manuscript score. Um, it's possible. Anyway, it's just, I think, of interest because whereas with any piece like this, ultimately, we're going to have to decide on a certain number of things, including Boeing's, of course. Um, my personal feeling is that I would prefer to make those decisions based on what the composer writes yeah. rather than what somebody else has already decided to do. Um, yeah. And that is in, in no way taking away from any particular performer or, or the value of those auditions. Um, but, you know, I think in the end, those performance auditions simply are just a reflection of what that person did, not what the composer necessarily wrote. And, um, and so it's good to know. After that, one can consult all of them if it's, um, you know, uh, interesting to see what what solutions various people came up with. Um, Petr, the, I, I wanted to bring up a subject which um, is possibly not uh, the simplest kind of thing. It has to do with the physical aspect of playing. Um, that's the simplest kind of thing to deal with under these particular circumstances being online. Nonetheless, it's the thing that I feel stands out the most when I see and hear you play um, that I think could be of help to you. So as much as we can deal with it, I mean, there would, there would be ultimately, a, hopefully a, a time that maybe we could actually be in the same room together. And I can, um, there's even a kind of exercise uh, which requires us to stand up, put the cello down, um, do something that I think would be helpful to you. I, I think I'm not going to attempt that now because I have a feeling it's going to be a big bust. So okay. please forgive me for that. Um, but I, as much as I can, I'll try to articulate what it is that I'm thinking. This is the impression. If you don't mind me, my being very direct. Please, my, yeah. my impression when I see you play and hear you play, I mean, you do many good things. <clears throat> I have the impression that somewhere in your thinking, more than anything else, you're focused on your hands, your right hand and your left hand. And what I feel you should be focused on is what's happening here, and especially all the excess tension that you hold in your neck yeah. and in your shoulder area. But in terms of your arms, I feel you need to liberate both your upper arms because I feel that you're, if, if I can just be so direct as to say it, that you're passive with your upper arms. It's a little bit like, um, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but it's a little bit like if you saw a conductor always conducting like this. Now there yeah. are some people who do that, but somewhere we're feeling we need 
to the whole upper body involved in that, even if in the end the motion is just this. But when you see the upper arms folded in, let's say, and they're just doing this, after a while, you're feeling like, I guess you can do certain things with this, but ultimately that's going to limit you to in, in many important ways. And that you could accomplish this still by doing this. And I don't know if you can see the difference when, when I did that, but I feel like here, for example, let's say with your left hand, you tend to be passive here and here. Okay. And you move around and while you're in a position, play basically from here on down. I don't know if you notice this, but there is, I find, excessive tension in your left hand when you play. And it's especially true as you go up the cello. And that's because I think the, the way we should be thinking of accomplishing moving around on the cello is with the large muscles. Essentially, all of these coming from the back. But very often, it's hard for us to visualize and conceive of playing from the back. We hear that and we know that to be true. And yet, it's just, you know, the back, it's sort of behind us. And I don't understand the back. You know, what? You, okay, play from the back. That sounds great. But what does it mean? Well, I think for us, it's easier to identify what's happening here. And that being the case, in fact, if you are playing from the back, and if you are playing from your upper arms, that is connected to your back, as long as you're not blocking off your shoulder. If you're not blocking off your shoulder and you are playing with your upper arms free and generating motion and power and freedom of motion and all things concerning, let's say with the bow, bow speed, contact, uh, exertion of pressure, allowing of weight, all these things happen from the upper arm, from these motions, from these motions. The same thing is true in the left arm. And as we go up the cello, it should be that we seek positions with our arm, essentially first with the upper arm. The forearm, when we go up, will start to open up. I can't show you these things. Obviously, that's not going to work here. And then the hand follows and then the fingers. Meaning the larger muscles first, the back, the next group from the upper arm, then to the forearm, then to the hand, then to the finger, then to the fingertips. In fact, it's like a food chain. The what happens in the fingers, it's a tributary of all that happened before. We don't play from our hands. This is my feeling. I know this sounds like dogma and I'm sorry to make it sound like dogma but I don't think we should be playing from our hands. I think everything that happens in our hands is coming from much farther back, every single impulse. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. You know, I wish I could show you what I mean by that because that might be more helpful than words. But in, in the present context, Th these are the tools I have. So um, if I could just explain the ex, because maybe if, if you can, if I can be clear of how to explain this and if you can relate to what I'm saying, maybe you can do this exercise. The exercise would be this. Hopefully this makes sense just to explain it. The exercise would be this. We should stand, with, obviously with the cello off to the side the bow and the cello off to the side. We should stand and our feet should be parallel to each other and in line with our shoulders. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. I mean, can you picture that? Yeah. Okay. The next thing we need to do is raise our shoulders as far as they could go. It's not meant to feel good. Yeah. The next thing we should do is rotate our arms that we therefore form a circle with our arms and our hands are opposite our nose, keeping our shoulders up the whole time. This is meant to identify those muscles in the back that are there to suspend the arms and to support and ultimately to allow energy to flow into the upper arm. 
And then the last step of the exercise is to completely release that and let our arms swing freely by their sides. When we release our arms, we should not be stiff, you know, in a robotic position. We should allow our arms to swing naturally. That's very important. The next step, the same thing, arms, the shoulders all the way up, rotate our arms inward, form a circle in front of our nose. And then when we release, we release to plane position with the same flexibility and freedom that we had as when we allowed our arms to just swing by our sides. In other words, we don't release to a stiff position, we release to a flexible position, okay? Supporting always from our back, through our upper arm, et cetera. You know? The last step, we sit down, we take the cello, we take the bow, we do the same thing. And then when we release, we just choose while we're in the air, a finger on any string, and we're gonna allow all of that to release on a note and vibrate and just feel what that's like. The point of this exercise, I don't know if it's already clear to you, but just to verbalize it, the point of it is to locate the power source, to allow for energy to release into the upper arms and to understand how we can support from the back through our arms and still have freedom, flexibility, and the ability to apply all the things we need, whether it is seeking position, applying pressure on the string, weight of the bow at the frog, pressure when we move away from the frog, all of these things, just to instill that all of what we should be doing is happening much farther back. It's not in the hands. The hands, of course, respond, and they do function, obviously. Um, and, and if you watch the hands, they are, of course, operating, and those small muscle, muscle groups are operating and functioning. But all of that has its origin farther back. And that, I, I don't know if that explanation was clear and if it made any sense to you. Uh, it's very clear. Very okay, clear. good. This is what I feel you need to do in just in terms of just generally thinking. Possibly if that exercise made sense and if you can do that um, with the cello and feel when you release and just hear maybe, I think what you'll find is more freedom in the sound, more freedom in the vibrato. Yeah. And then ultimately, maybe transfer it to the parts of the cello where you yourself feel you need more freedom, you know, and, and see what happens so that you can make the connection between, well, okay, I'm here and I don't feel so free and I don't usually feel free. How can I feel that? To instill that even then, that's where you need to feel the sensations and the origin of the sensations coming from and that it's not meant to be man manufactured from here, okay? Yeah. So th that's what I would have liked to, to do if, you know, we had the, the chance to physically do that. But anyway, having said that, if that made any sense, hopefully that will be of some help. Um, and um, let's go back and do um, maybe from something from the beginning, let's, let's maybe work on, work on some of this. The, uh, at the beginning of the of the movement. Um, I don't know what's in your edition, but in any case, in the original edition, bom, bom, there's accents on both those notes. Yeah. Okay? There is not an accent on the C sharp in the next bar. It's usually played with an accent. It's not there. It's possible he didn't mean it. And if he didn't mean it, I'm wondering what that sound could be if it's not an accent. You don't have to tell me. Maybe just try it and see what you think. Better? Rather than, let's say, okay, I won't make an accent. And it's true, you didn't make an accent. I'm thinking... The phrase is still risoluto. That's the character of it. It's yeah. a Slavonic dance. It's some type of a Slavonic dance. It has a strong rhythmic character. So I don't think we want to get rid of the, the, the rhythmic impulse, 
But maybe because it doesn't have an accent, it could be that that bar is more singing than the first bar. And that it's dom, bom, ti, ya, da, da. The third bar is team, da, 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 da. So that in fact, within the same phrase, which has the same character, it's not a uniform character. It's just all within a, the same character. Bom, bom, ta, la, da, da, team, da, 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 da. Now, if that's so, in my opinion, Dvorak was right. The second bar should not have an accent. He didn't write it. And maybe that suggests because there is an expressive change on it. Yeah. Let's try that. Yeah. Let's start just the second measure in y'all, la da da, and try to sing the C sharp. Yeah. Better. Maybe a, a, a stroke of the bow where it's not only rhythmic, but Espressivo, yes, good. Let's put that in the context of the phrase now. Yeah, for me, that speaks. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's interesting. It's true. You know, sometimes we might think, well, look, you know, he wrote two accents. So chances are the next note has an accent but it's not there. But then the third bar does, and then makes me wonder, well, that probably means he doesn't want an accent. So what could that be? Now, it is true, we are very much conditioned by what we hear people do. And you have to admit it, when you hear this played, it's usually played where every note has an accent. But if one notices that it's not there, it is possible that these things could suggest, and in the end, their uh, tools to notate these things are considering how much expression exists in music, the, the, the notational tools are incredibly insufficient. Unless you're going to write a paragraph for every single note and say, no, I don't want an accent, but what I would like is a singing sound, but still within the context of the phrase and don't lose tempo. That's a lot to write on one note. I don't, you know, Mozart couldn't have written all those pieces if he had to do that in every single note, you know? So I think these are things that we can only experiment with and somehow, I don't know what the word is, intuit or, or imagine and then see what, if it makes any sense. But I think there's something to it. Let's go to the next phrase. I know that's, that's an incredibly nasty thing to play, um, you know, but let's, let's think about just First of all, can I ask what fingering do you do there? Dum pa, yum pa dum, just a thumb and one, but what, what, you use third finger. Third finger. And Have you tried second, second finger? One. Have you tried second finger? No, uh, not on this one. Right. Yeah, but, but obviously the second finger is going to be more extended than the third. This yeah. is true, but surprisingly, even when you play it with two, it's sharp. It's not as far as you think. Yeah. And the reason why I'm suggesting two is for the simple reason that basically what we're doing is a trill motion. Yeah. You know, and for most people, it's simpler to trill one, two than one, three, though one, three is possible. The problem is, in that register, the hand is very compact and it might actually be more comfortable and you might have more freedom of motion and ultimately gain more accuracy, accuracy and speed if you actually play what's comfortable instead of the, the, the finger that normally we would play in that position, which would be the third because we're in the octave position. However, you're very high and the hand is extremely compact. And I think in this case, we can make an exception to the rule you might find more comfort. Let's try it. Maybe try it slowly. Dee dee da dee da dee da. Just the D string. Da dee da dee da. And Peter? Yeah? Good. I, I think you need not press the thumb. The harmonic is available there. You can liberate some of the tension in your hand by releasing the thumb. It will sound.
Okay. Now, I think I think what's necessary is to find the proper bow placement with regard to the bridge and to establish the proper pressure and speed, how that relates so that these notes do sound. Da -di -da -di -da -di -da -di -da. Right now, it sounds to me that the bow speed is too slow for the pressure or that the pressure is too great for the bow speed, but they need to be combined. In, yeah. Do, do, you, do you hear what I mean? The, the sound is somewhat choked on the on on the on the the second finger notes. I, it's better. It's better. Can I can I suggest that you play a little bit closer to the bridge? I think I think you're going to find it more in that zone, okay? Yeah. Because you're high up with the left hand, you must come closer to the bridge anyway. That's a, you know we know that, but very often we don't observe that in those situations, and it, very often we think it's a left hand problem, and in fact it's a bow problem. Yeah. The reason why it's speaking, not speaking as you want, is not because of the left hand; it's the bow. Um, the the rhythm. The first note is short. I know that's uncomfortable to do. You tend to play long, but it's short. Can we just play just that? Can I, better? Can I suggest that you? really engage your upper arm in that. So your arm is down here, maybe engage it, get it into the action. There, your upper arm. Okay. Yeah, it's still sort, of, still sort of hanging a little bit. Look, can you actually play from, from up here, from here? No, not from here, from here. That, that, yes, no. And then don't let it come down. Yum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Yeah. And suggestion to actually play a martelet stroke on the string and control each one of those actions. Yum, ba -dum. The bow starts and stops on the string. Yes, yeah. For me, lifting the bow, or as we call it, throwing the bow, lifting, throwing, lifting, throwing, that there are, is, there is a chance for so much discrepancy in the rhythm, in the attack of the bow. And meanwhile, we're dealing also with a left-hand problem. I think we have to be super controlled with the bow in a situation like that. Okay. You know, to give ourselves a, you know, a chance to really make it sound. Okay. Let's, let's go to the next phrase. Uh, yum, da -da, rum, da -di. Yeah. If you see the, the score, you'll be surprised at what's actually written there. It's not that. Okay. But it, it's fine. I mean, it's yum, ta -dum, ta yum, ta -dum. It's just a single D. And the next notes are not separate. It's slurred. La -da 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 -da. This is stuff that cellists have done over the years, and they've added a lot of stuff. And you know how, you know how cellists are, you know. We're all guilty of this. But um, yeah. the fact is, I think it would be very interesting for you, just from a, you know, a strictly compositional standpoint, just just to see these things, you might think, gee, w what's wrong with the slur? You might think that. And you might think, it, it can be done. Well, I'm going to try it. Yeah. Personally, I do the slur. Because actually, I think once again, it's like in the theme. There's a more sort of martial aspect, palm, palm, than singing. La, 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 la. 
here. Yum, da dum, rum, da da, la da da, dee da I that's possible in music, no? To have variety within a phrase, I think yeah. it's possible. Vorjak writes it. You know, it's just would be interesting for you to try, but I, let's not worry about it now. You know, obviously, I just wanted to suggest that um, the, here, a simple thing like this, you'd be surprised when you see it, actually what Dvorak writes, yeah. you know? And you might wonder yourself, gee, why do we have to change it? We don't, actually. Let, let's skip to the next section. Of course, really, the theme is in the clarinet. So I think, and I know you know that. So I think we need to play off that. And very often when we hear this played, it sounds like this is the main line. Swooning and, you know. But meanwhile, it's actually a counter melody. So I think it's important to feel the missing beat and to play off that beat. Let's try that. So maybe to yourself, at least think or feel the word and or another syllable. Mm, maybe mm is fine. Mm, ta, or you can say and. And, ta, da, 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 and or another word. If you prefer, it could be German, und. I don't, doesn't matter to me, you know. But or let's try, mm, ta, yeah. Because the point is the eighth is a syncopation and it's coming off the main beat. Yeah. Yeah, suggestion, unless you really feel it must be there, I'm not sure the glissando coming down really adds a lot musically. Maybe fourth finger. Yeah. How about one? For me, yeah. Yeah. You know? But these are things, once again, you have to see how you respond to that. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's, I, it's, it's not a right or wrong situation. Beautiful. Um, can we do one more thing? I, I, I know we have to finish fairly soon. The moderato section, the G major section, the great section. Yeah. That is actually before we get to the coda in the main body of the movement before the coda that's the slowest of all the episodes right um that's 84 to the quarter if i recall and so that's even a little bit more tranquil than i think you can feel more space I think it's grand music. It's not huge music. It's not, yeah. but it's grand. Just open your arms to the world, you know? Let's try that. Good. Get it? Can I suggest? It's a suggestion I made earlier uh, since we've been online. Maybe seek a different part of your first finger so you can get a thicker sound, not the tip more where there's fat on the finger towards your first joint. Now, can I suggest that rather than do this, let your torso, the whole torso turn this way. No, the other way, the other way. Yeah, and now let your first finger contact the string. Yes, try that. Okay, so I think what we want here in terms of vibrato is something vibrant, but not especially agitated, something warm and generous. That's probably comparatively, because we all have a natural vibrato, whatever that is, but comparatively, probably not a faster vibrato, probably, probably just rounder and more generous and warm, you know? Um, yeah. Oh, of course, I mean, we're, we're, we're skimming through, but I, I think we're supposed to go to Q&A now. So I, I'm very sorry to just 
just touched a few spots, but hopefully the exercise, this, this thing will help, you know, and you can feel a little bit more how to generate all those motions from your back power and all that. Okay. Thank you very much. Good. You're very welcome, Pedro. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Roger, uh, Gary, for that class. And now we welcome back Zoe and Ellen as well. And I think we're going to have some questions and answers to finish off this afternoon masterclass. Um, Ellen, I think you have a question, do you, for mm -hmm. the maestro? Yeah. So firstly, I just want to say a massive thank you once again for all your helpful thoughts and advice this afternoon. And my question is that I know, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world at the moment, but I was wondering how you think the pandemic will affect the careers of the next generation of cellists. Yeah, well, you know, that is a big and important question. And, um, and if I could say, Ellen, uh, if I could add something to your question, it's not just affecting the career of the next generation of cellists, but also this generation of cellists and my generation of cellists too. Even though, of course, you're concerned about the future and we're all concerned about the future. And, you know, I wish I had a crystal ball and I could tell you. Um, what I can tell you is um, I've had the same experience you've had in throughout all this, which is uh, we're taking it one day at a time and we don't really know um and i certainly don't know because you know i'm a lot older than you are but i've never lived this before and that's part of the problem here is that even people like me who've done this for you know many many years and have spent a bunch of years on this earth have no idea what to anticipate or to expect one thing for sure is and i've talked to a lot of people about it um I actually just spent, uh, I did my first trip on Monday, two days ago. It's the first time I live in Paris. It's the first time I've taken any public transportation. I took a, a, a train. It's the first time I've been on, I traveled, you know, pretty much like that. You know, it's like I'm on the road. Um, and that's the first time I've been on the road in since early March, right? So even for me, that felt new, but that newness suddenly became old because it's familiar, you know, so I got on a train and I saw about half my class. It's a small class, four people. And I gave each of them um, two lessons in the two days. And I saw the director of the school. It's the Chapelle in, in, in Belgium in Waterloo. And um, I talked to the director and um, he's an optimistic guy but he's concerned about the future and not just this year, you know? And I don't know. I mean, he's also looking from just a practical and business standpoint, the, all the ramifications this will have. Um, one thing I can say is I would like to be optimistic and I believe that music will definitely survive because we need it. And I think young musicians like you will survive, but it's probable that things won't be exactly the same as they were. Um, right now, they're nothing like they were. We know that. But I don't think that this will continue ad infinitum like this. We've already adapted in many ways. If you think back to March or April, you know, like me, you know, I went and, um, you know, saw my students who I haven't seen except online. And next week I'm giving some classes, if all goes well, in the south of France, just a few people, and actually playing a concert. You think, well, at your stage, that shouldn't be such a big deal. Um, not true. Well, you didn't ask me, I'm gonna ask the question in your place, but um, I'm wondering what it's gonna be like for me to play a concert. I mean, I do play, but it's been five months and it's going to feel very strange, you know, um, and that's what's happening now. And I couldn't have imagined that three or four months ago. So here we are. So we're adapting. And then, of course, things are changing now. You know, some places it's getting worse again. Um, 
it's fluid. We're, we're trying to find solutions. And therefore, I wish I could answer your question. Um, my instinct tells me music is going to survive and there will be a place for young musicians. But exactly what that's going to be, I don't know if anybody really knows that. But I think that what's happened in the last several years, because there are many people who are looking to establish themselves and looking for opportunities and so forth. And I think they find that it's important to be creative. It's important to have ideas and to find ways of reaching people and building a public and, and finding ways to, uh, to establish a forum to be heard and so forth in ways that maybe 50 years ago or even 20 or 10 years ago, people were not doing. There's a need and so the need has to be filled and that's gonna fall also on your shoulders. What happens to people like me? It's hard to say, you know, I come from another time. Um, I'm not sure how I'm gonna deal with all of that. You know, um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I've decided through all of this not to put pressure on myself, to try to stay safe and protect, help the people I can, including myself if I can, um, and sort of wait and see. Um, to continue and hope that uh, that time will come. And ever so gradually, some things have opened up. You know, depending on what part of the world you're in, obviously that that's quite variable. Uh, my my son and his wife live in the New York area that just had a baby two weeks ago. You can imagine what having a baby in this time is. It's not the simplest thing, you know. I haven't seen him yet. I don't know when I will. Um, so you know, this is all this is all new, you know. But it's hard to project even six months from now, you know. But, you know, I, I can't guarantee anything to you, Ellen. But my instinct tells me I've lived long enough. I've seen a bunch of problems. I remember 30 years ago, 40 years ago, people were saying, we're going to lose our audience. It's dying away. It won't, in 30, 30 years, there's no classical music anymore. Well, guess what? It's still around. And I think it will survive. I think it will survive because um, people need people need it. Maybe not everybody needs it, but there's enough people who need it. And you know, there are times when you don't have enough uh, to eat and need a place to live or whatever. But then those are also the times when you turn to things that feed us spiritually. And of course, music is clearly one of them. So while music often gets shortchanged when budgets are cut, in the end, people always seem to realize somewhere that it's necessary. So I think there's always going to be a place. It might take some doing on your part as to how you're going to find that way for you to be heard. But that's always been true through the generations in one way or another, you know just haven't had to deal with this. And these are, these are tough times. I'm not going to kid you. They are tough times. You know, everybody's hurting. But I don't see things disappearing. I really don't. So I think you'll find it. You're a smart person. I think you'll, you'll, you'll figure it out. You know, we all will. We need it. So, and we're not the only ones. So there's still an audience. And there's still people who want music. Thank you, Thank you Gary. You're welcome. Thank you, Ellen. Um, Zoe, do you have a question? Um, yeah, mine is, my question is also in the context of everything that's going on right now, the pandemic. And it kind of leading on from what Ellen was saying, um, obviously everything, everyone has been, has really kind of uh, needed to rethink. And specifically in music, I think, uh, as you were saying, like everyone, it's necessary now that we're, we really kind of make an effort to be adaptable. And uh, specifically like with, with the complete like removal of kind of external deadlines, concerts, lesson, in-person lessons, um, 
I was just wondering uh, if you have any thoughts or advice on um, maybe how, what you've been doing, like in terms of maybe creating your own deadlines for yourself or kind of maintaining kind of structure when so much has changed. You're speaking s about basically motivation, right? Just in I, some ways. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe motivation kind of ties into it. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose. Well, I mean, I don't know if that's exactly what, what you meant, but I, as I take it, I'm thinking, how does one stay in this? I mean, and I have to be honest with you, it, it was tough for me at the beginning. I'm not going to, you know, I, you may know some people say, oh, you know, I, I love it. You know, I've been practicing nine hours a day and right from the first day and it's fine, you know, and I, I can play the Pieri Caprices backwards and forwards and standing on my head. You know, I couldn't do that before. Um, yeah, I wasn't one of those. Um, I wasn't exactly depressed, but, um, um, and, and I'm not saying this really in any, any, any kind, I'm not, I'm not that type, but, um, um, if, you know, everything came like to, for everybody to a grinding halt, but, uh, my schedule was just, you know, everything was packed together and it was, it, it went within 48 hours from how am I going to get through this month and next month to six months have disappeared and also well into this coming season and even next year already. Um, and, and, and that, you know, is something that I had never experienced before where it, it was just going to the next thing and preparing and thinking in advance and all that, you know, and suddenly it all came to this grinding halt and, there, I was left with this big void and, and, and when you're a young person, um, you know, there, there are certain aspects about, you know, practicing and, you know, learning things and, you know, and then when you're older, you know, you've done a lot of those things and you still have many things you want to improve, but it, it's sort of these, uh, these points along the way that you aim for and you, you know, uh, it's harder to motivate yourself sort of in a general way. Oh, great. I have time to practice. Some people did. I, it didn't, it didn't go that way with me. I'd be, I'll be very honest with you. And, and then gradually I, you know, I started looking at new pieces and so forth and I would drop them quickly. And then I would look at another one and I would drop it. And I found, tried to find different ways. Um, and then I just decided stop putting, all this pressure, just, just go with what you feel. And I started to get back to it, you know, and I, I didn't actually set projects for myself, but curiously enough, I learned a bunch of music in all this time. I learned a bunch of music without setting um, goals. Every time I set a goal, I fell short. It didn't work that way for me. I needed something else. I needed just to live. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. I haven't had a vac vacation in so many years. My son kept telling me, telling me, you need a vacation, you need a vacation. When all of this started, he said, well, now you got it. And I thought, yeah, but vacation. First of all, I didn't decide on it. So this was a problem for me because I had no control. And I do like to have control over my life. I don't like to control anybody else, but I like to control my life. Of course, I lost that like everybody did, right? Um, and I couldn't do the things I wanted to do. I like to go to football games, I, you know, uh, things like that. They were gone. All, all, all the things I would like to do in my vacation, go to the beach. I couldn't do that. Go to the, watch football. I couldn't do that. So it's like, great. I got a vacation. Now all the things I want to do in my vacation, I cannot do in my vacation. So I let go of that. And I let go of all those things. And actually, I started to just live. And when I did this trip on Monday... I remember saying to somebody, you know, um, for five months, I've actually lived like a normal human being. People who stay home, you know, they don't travel all the time, don't have the stress constantly of take, taking that plane and taking that train and getting up and I'm not missing this and that, you know, you know, and suddenly I started to enjoy it. The only problem is I know that that can't go on forever. And this is not possible for, for you 
because you have your whole life to look forward to. You know, I, the bulk of, I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound dark here, but the bulk of my life and my career is behind me. It's not in, in front of me. You know, I'm 64 years old. You know, I don't have 40 years career ahead of me. I do not. I have no much, don't know how much life I have ahead of me. I mean, none of us knows that, but you know, I don't have that. So it's totally different. Psychologically, it's very different for me than for you. But I know that for me, once I let go of all that stuff, I actually started living again, you know? But then comes the next. And the next is, I don't know. I know I want to see my grandson. I don't know when that's going to be. It would be nice to get on stage. I'm going to do that next week. Let's see how that goes. Things are getting worse in France. Maybe it'll be canceled before next week. I have no idea, you know? So right now, I don't... I don't have any projects. Some of my students, one guy set up a recording studio and he recorded the Kodayana company and all kinds of stuff. That was his plan for the summer. He says he has a few concerts now. He says, I'm almost annoyed about it because actually I had all these recording plans. So there you are, but he's very enterprising and all that. You know, I just decided to take a totally different approach to this, but I have to admit, you know, I'm not a young person who has all these plans and is wondering, and again, it's a totally different thing. And I'm, you asked me, you know, how I'm, how I did, this is what I did. Is that what you should do? Well, you're you and I'm me. So probably not, you know, um, and I don't necessarily have advice, but what I did do, I was involved with a project with the Chappelle where everybody who decided they wanted to participate, including ex students, we put something online like many people did, but we had a Bach project. We called it, we've got your Bach, you know, like we've got your back. And um, each suite was played by six different people. And some people played two or three times, you know. So the fact is each week we put on a new suite, each day was a, a movement. And then on Sunday, instead of being a day of rest, it was a day of hearing the whole suite. And then Monday was the next suite. And we did that for six weeks. And uh, people got into it and it gave the students who were all you know around here and there and various parts of the world, including America, um, meaning you know we don't know when we'll see them next time, but um, and that gave them something. So you know, I, I thought that was a good thing. I did the summer session the last two days. It's my first trip, as I told you. Um, so you know, face to face with distance and all that, you know, like we should, obviously. Um, and I felt like that was important because they're missing an awful lot of things in the summer and so forth. So I thought this might be a good thing and I can do this now. I couldn't do that two months ago. So I'm, I'm aware that, you know, having those things and having those things you can look forward to are very important. And actually I, I realized how important it was to me because I've spent all this time alone, you know, um, and, you know, no family, nothing you know really i've i've basically lived like a hermit for five months now and to actually get out in the world and see some people that i know and everything it made me realize how important that is you know you'd think at 64 i should know that all already but you know even at my age you can learn a few things you know thank you gary lots of food for thought there <laughs> um yeah so Pater. Do you have a question which is also yeah. pandemic related yeah. or perhaps not? Well, actually mine well, isn't pandemic related at all, actually. It, was, so I suppose it's to do with um, before everything uh, stopped, but just I wondered whether you'd speak a bit about um, chamber music in, I suppose, the kind of musical life and career that you have. So what position it has and maybe what kind of importance it might have. And more specifically, I wondered, um, because uh, I know you've done a bit of sort of guest playing with very established uh, groups and quartets and I wondered what the challenges of that are if the, you know because they might have specific ways of doing things and, and how you navigate those when you when you say with 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 uh, established groups you're talking about in the chamber music situation you're not talking about playing with orchestras no, not really. Yeah, chamber you're talking music. about like when you're guest of the Schubert for the Schubert Quintet with a quartet and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, no, it's a good question. First of all, I come from a family of musicians. Fortunately, not all of us are around anymore, but uh, I do come from a family of musicians. And for me, music was always present and chamber music was always present. At a young age, I played with my family. We played a lot of quartets together. Uh, there were six of us. So, you know, we, we did a lot of the, the literature with piano and so forth. So for me, chamber music, I never saw a difference between chamber music and solo playing or orchestra playing. My father was a conductor. I always heard the orchestra play. I knew the orchestral repertoire just from listening to it as a kid. Um, um, I, I, I listened to my mother practicing the violin concertos and stuff. She was a violinist. Um, so for me, music is music. So chamber music, I don't see as anything separate. It, it does involve perhaps a certain special set of skills in terms of how you're going to negotiate your way within rehearsals, listening, playing, how you deal with people, different opinions, all this kind of stuff. And, but that also, a lot of that came for just from growing up in a family of four kids, you know, sort of social skills and so forth. You know, so I think in a way, chamber music for me was always a very natural thing. At the same time, of course, ultimately there are people that you prefer to play with, there are people that you prefer not to play with and this kind of stuff. And if you have a chance and you can choose and you can make suggestions, you do so. My experience in my life is I play with everybody. I, I, I'm not saying I do it well, but I think I can play with anybody. You know, after that, if you ask me, well, don't you prefer? Well, of course I do. Of course I do. But I think if you're a professional and if you're a reasonable person, you can communicate with people and find a way to, to, to be positive and find a way to say something or, you know, and because in, for me, uh, and I'll answer the other question, of course, but on an ad hoc basis, when you're playing with different people, this happens all the time, chamber music festivals, different concerts you're asked for, you maybe three of the people you know, what the next one you don't know, maybe they, none of them you know, whatever. But if you're professional and the music is the, is the, 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 uh, the focal point, the music itself, my main point is not to get everybody to play the way I want them to, not at all. What I'm looking for is to produce the best performance possible in whatever way that uh, mean, whatever that means and however that is required to happen. That's my main goal. And in terms of playing with, let's say, if you're invited to play the Schubert Quintet with a, a quartet, or maybe two people are invited to play Brahms sextets and things like that. It's a very good point because I feel at that point, given that what the quartets generally do is they'll rehearse those pieces without the guest or guests. And not once, but more than once. Maybe not as much as they're going to rehearse their quartets, but they will rehearse them. That being the case, unless it's a very special kind of quartet, and they do exist, where they can really respond to somebody else coming in, chances are you're going to have to fit in a little bit more than you can get them to come your way. But generally speaking, it's some type of combination of both. And then you try, I don't know how else to say this, but you try to tweak the situation a little bit. Like you do something and see how they respond. If it falls on deaf ears, you might try that once more. And if it falls on deaf ears again, you don't try it anymore. My feeling is, uh, this could sound very strange to a lot of people. I'm one of those that prefers rehearsing to be done just with the ears. For me, the less talking, the better. Though I think talking can be helpful sometimes. But for me, the, usually what I talk about in rehearsals is anything but music. And in that way, you find a deeper connecting point with the various personalities. And then there's a greater chance that maybe they're gonna be more open and listen more. For me, the best playing is all about listening. That's what it's about. I'll give you one example, which I thought was very telling. I won't mention names, but these were two people you probably know. 
we had to, and it was a festival. The violinist showed up at the end of the morning or the beginning of the afternoon. And that night we had to play the Schubert E flat trio. Okay. He had played it, Janice had played it, I had played it, but we never played it together. So you, most people would say, but how can you do that? You can, but it's not going to be any good. Not necessarily. Could be good. I mean, there were three, you know, decent players. So, um, and what I thought was really interesting was how the violinist approached that. So it was our one rehearsal, right, in the afternoon. So we were about to start and the violinist says, let's play it under tempo. And my first reaction, I didn't say anything. My first internal reaction was, Okay, we got one rehearsal. We never played this together. We got to play the Schubert E flat tonight. It's a 40 minute piece. Don't you think we should play, play it through once in tempo? I didn't say that. So I thought, okay. We played every movement through under tempo. Every movement. That was our rehearsal. The performance was one of the best performances I ever did of the Schubert E flat trio. And I wondered what was that all about? And then I realized it. And I don't know if that's why the vi violence is a very intelligent guy, you know, and a real, you know, an artist. And I thought, maybe that was the best thing to do under those circumstances, because when you play slowly, there's only one thing you can do listen to the others. You can't impose anything of yourself, nothing. You can't impose anything. So nobody imposed anything at all, nothing. Even something basic as a tempo, nothing. And then the concert just happened and we were listening. It was obvious every second and creating something. Now, of course, that could have been a big disaster, but with these guys, no. And I thought that was a really interesting experiment, not just musically, but sociologically. You know, just how you deal with such a situation. And I think that has a lot to do with what happens and should happen in rehearsal. Not about one person insisting and the other, but actually just being open. Of course, it happens sometimes you end up with people who don't want to listen, they're only interested in doing what they do. Sometimes you also deal with people who are not, maybe they're lacking in a certain level of competence, musically or instrumentally or whatever. You know, of course this happens. With these guys, that was not the case, you know? So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's important to have a certain element of trust, but a certain kind of human in, perception and intelligence about how one goes about these things. When I hear people, you know, uh, we only rehearsed five times and I'm thinking, gee, I never have the luxury of rehearsing anything five times, you know? Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not the only one. We've, you know, been in these situations, so, but it's not possible. I mean, a performance can't be good if you don't rehearse a lot. That's completely untrue. It's completely untrue. On the other hand, I have played performances where we rehearsed, you know, Real four real rehearsals and the performance was nothing to speak about, you know. So the the reality and the truth is somewhere else, you know. But um, the the issue of when you're a guest with a with a, an established group, it there's no absolute way to do this, you know. There's no, I don't ever go in thinking I'm going to do this. You sort of. You listen, you try, you see, and, and you have to, I mean, I don't know if I'm a perceptive or not a perceptive person. People have said that, that I can be, let's say maybe a little perceptive. So I try to somehow feel a little bit what through, you know, the, uh, a, a little glint in their eye or a reaction to a phrase and you said, oh, okay okay, yeah, there's something there. And then you try to go with that and see, and then suddenly you establish something. It's this kind of unspoken communication. Sometimes it's just the way somebody turns his head or 
smiles at you in in a sincere way you know and you think oh okay this, maybe there's a way to communicate here you know it's all very interesting stuff though it is and gary i think if you've proven anything in the last two and a half hours it's that you're very perceptive we certainly can well i it's nice of you to say that but you know i uh, sometimes i wonder sometimes oh, things no. elude elude me and i'm thinking how did i miss that no, but, i know we're know. all human yeah. Um, thank you so much for these three um, questions and these three great answers. We're way over time, but we did get several questions oh, in from sorry. from the YouTube um, audience, and I just want to bring you one okay. um, of those questions that I've chosen as their final question, uh, and it's an interesting one, and it's about performance anxiety, and it says, has performance anxiety ever been an issue for you, and if so, how did you deal with it? Of course, if the answer is no, well, then it's going to be a really, really quick answer. <laughs> I'll try to make the answer quick anyway. I, I wouldn't say that I have a general problem with performance anxiety. I would say that I, like everybody, gets nervous for concerts. It's not like you have to... I've heard of people being having uh, requiring practically being pushed on stage to, to, to play. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of those. On the same time, I don't really believe that anybody can't that anybody cannot be nervous for a concert. The fact that we spend all this time not being on stage, and then there's those moments we're on stage, and it's different. Every concert has its reality, every experience has its own truth and its own context. And that alone invites a certain amount of trepidation or wondering at least what it's going to be. We can do it a hundred times the way we like at home, but how do we know that the hundred first time will be the way we want? We don't know that. We can only try to guarantee a certain number of things. My, my feeling is that on some level about the performance anxiety, somewhere I do have a need to be on stage, somewhere I do have a need through music to communicate and to say something that I think is important, at least to me. And therefore, even though I have anxiety that's, uh, if that's the word, trepidation that it'll go well, there is also a desire to be there. And given sure. that, that's what I try to focus on. After that, I try to control what I can control because I feel that that's going to give me a better chance to go out and be free about it and to have some certainty that that it can go well. I do, to, to finish the, the answer, I would like to say, if you do something 10 times and nine times it's bad and one time it's good, you probably have a reason to be anxious about it going well in the concert. Because let's face it, chances are it will not. So you have to find a way to guarantee a certain amount of consistency so you can establish a reasonable amount of confidence that at least it could go well. And the rest is psychological. It, it, you, can, you can undermine yourself, you can do everything right. And then the minute before you go on the stage thinking, I'm terrible, this will be a disaster. Or you could say, you know, I did everything I could. I'm gonna take a deep, deep breath and I'm gonna to try to go out and enjoy it as much as possible. Chances are more times than not, that will work better than the other way. And that's how I take it. Just try to do what you can and then go out, go for it and enjoy the experience and accept the nerves. The nerves are normal. Don't try to fight them. Don't try to say, what am I nervous for? There's a reason to be nervous. It's not all irrational. Well, on that positive note, Gary, I want yeah. to thank you for- Was that positive? Well, I hope that's positive. That was positive, yeah. Okay, I good. It was. I want to thank you for taking the time thank to- you. Thank you. Pleasure. Spending time today with our three cellists and thank also Ellen and thank Zoe and Padre for all the cellists. playing for us. And, um, yeah, it's been fascinating. So thank you. And the National Concert Hall International Master Course continues this week with further seminars and master classes mm -hmm. and a panel discussion, I believe, on Friday evening. Yeah, we'll be seeing each other in a couple of days again, we right? We will. For, for two. And, two um, yes. Yeah. So um, check out nch.ie for all the details and the times and the YouTube links. And um, thank you again. So we'll see you all very soon. Thank you and good afternoon. Enjoy. Bye. Thank you.